Yeah, that, that might be better. Let's see. So that's the Diksha. And that also shows us the importance of spiritual practice in Advaita Vedanta. Why? Is that it increases our power to put into practice uh, our knowledge. So often I, I have this complaint. I know what you're teaching. I know, I know what Vedanta says. I am awareness. I am the witness. But it doesn't seem to help me. Why it doesn't seem to help me is that our mind, that is emotions, thinking, senses, and the organs of action are not under control. So they are moving according to past habit and past conditioning. Now my understanding has shifted. I have new knowledge, new insight, but my insight is there and my habits and tendencies are here. There's a gap. This gap has to be bridged by spiritual practice. The body, mind, body, mind, speech should respond to the new understanding. That's why I like Swami Vivekananda's definition of religion. He says religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. Manifestation of the divinity already within us, not knowledge of the uh, divinity already within us. It's very interesting. If you read classical Advaita Vedanta, if you wanted to define what they're trying to say, it's a manifestation, you would say that it's a knowledge of the divinity already within us. But knowledge often in our day and age, you know, it is you read something and understanding something, that's knowledge. I don't think the ancients regarded it that way. Knowledge was something that was lived for them, not only understood, taught, understood, but also lived. And that living requires spiritual practice, a certain amount of austerity, a certain amount of control over the body, the senses, the emotions, uh, the thought patterns, and speech. Then you can express in life what you have understood. If the expression is easy, your spiritual practice is strong. If the expression runs up against a lot of internal obstacles, the real obstacles are internal. Internal obstacles, then we need more spiritual practice. What is the spiritual practice which helps in the manifestation of your knowledge, your non-dual knowledge? It is karma yoga, it is bhakti yoga, and it is raja yoga. It is meditation, it is devotion, and it is selflessness. All on the basis of an ethical life. It helps. It really helps. Once I was reading this paper on um, what is meant by enlightenment. The paper was written by a Buddhist scholar, but it applies to us. So the enlightenment, um, one is a paradigm shift. I thought I was this person, young man, prince called Siddhartha. Now I realize I am uh, awareness. I am ever free, unlimited awareness, the Buddha nature I've realized. So I am now a Buddha. This is a paradigm shift, but that's not the only meaning of being a Buddha. It's not only, not only a paradigm shift, not only a change in my understanding of myself. It's also, we would expect from a Buddha, Buddha-like qualities, compassion, perfect self-control, serenity, the ability to withstand troubles and afflictions in life, selflessness and love for everybody. Those are the qualities of a Buddha and would expect it uh, in, in an enlightened person. So to be a Buddha means not only both, uh, not only the, the uh, enlightenment, the answer to the who am I, but also the expression of the qualities. To be a Jivan Mukta in Advaita Vedanta, to be free while living, it's so not only the realization, aham brahmasmi, I am brahman, I am pure consciousness. Jidananda rupa shivoham. But also the qualities uh, which, which are mentioned in the Gita, for example, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna asks Krishna, what are the characteristics of an enlightened one? Sthitapragyasya kavasha. And several characteristics are mentioned by uh, Krishna. In 13th chapter, several, 20 qualities and mentioned by Krishna, which are, which are constitutive of, of realization. None of them are, I am Brahman. No, 
They are manifestations of the realization that I am Brahman. So when we get upset, I have completed a course on, and I know that I am Brahman, I am pure awareness. And then I get upset if someone cuts me off on the road and then I go into a road rage. What happens? It's not that your understanding has changed, your understanding is still there. But at that moment, it didn't work. At that moment, past conditioning cut in. Not only the guy has cut you up on the road, your past conditioning has cut off your enlightenment. And then you react in rage. But later you realize, so the problem with this is, if, if I keep on living and speaking and thinking the way I have been doing earlier, after a course in Vedanta, then the gap between what I understand and what I know and what I'm doing becomes wider and wider. There is a, a huge cognitive dissonance. So it has to be bridged. If it is not bridged, then at best one may understand what Vedanta teaches, but one is not enlightened. Enlightenment in, in Advaita Vedanta fully, it means Jivan Mukti, free while living. So one must be free of the problems thrown at us by the world. One must be able to transcend those problems. So a good example is Sri Ramakrishna himself, when he is dying of throat cancer and in terrible pain. His disciple, was later Swami Turiyananda, a young man called Hari. Uh, he comes and he asks, sir, how are you today? And Sri Ramakrishna says that, oh, it hurts, I'm in pain and I cannot eat, there's a tumor. It's an advanced stage of throat cancer. And then Hari, for some reason, he says, but sir, I see that you're in great bliss. And instead of being upset, it's a nasty thing, a cruel thing to say to a cancer, dying cancer patient. Instead of saying, uh, becoming upset, Sri Ramakrishna says, oh, the rascal has found me out. The rascal has caught me. <laughs> that means somehow this young man has intuited a deeper truth about me. There's a surface level truth that it is cancer, that I am a rapidly weakening patient suffering from cancer and, and uh, actually suffering. But there's a deeper truth to it that I'm not suffering actually. And from that perspective, I am in bliss. Now this ability to know one's real nature that I am the witness consciousness. At that point, there is no cancer there. Consciousness doesn't have cancer. But that's not denial, it's not escapism. That's more true than just to say I'm dying of cancer. I'm dying of cancer, the body is afflicted by cancer and it's deteriorating. And the mind is responding to the discomfort and pain. But then when the mind refocuses on the real nature of the mind, who am I? If it is witness consciousness, then the mind gets peace. Some of that peace and quiet is actually transferred to the body also. So the ability to withstand serious discomfort and pain. But that comes only because of a lot of spiritual practice where the bridge between one's inner intuition and the outer expression is, is clear, is unobstructed. If it's not obstructed. If it is obstructed, then the problem is, I might feel I've got something, then I'll keep complaining. I, I am unable to practice it in life. There, Advaita Vedanta cannot help us. Because Advaita Vedanta expects that we have got the fourfold qualifications, fourfold practices, which were mentioned yesterday. We are ready for Advaita Vedanta. But Vedanta expects it. They've told us, told it to us ad nauseum. Now, after the end of all of that, we complain. And the, near the peak of Everest, oh, I forgot my oxygen back at the base camp. So you have to go all the way back. Are you going to be gasping for breath? The uniqueness of Advaita Vedanta. So uh, Swami Vivekananda said all of which I just said. Swami Vivekananda said in this path, many come to an understanding, few realize. That's a warning. And what does the, what is the condition of realization on this path? Not the teaching. The teaching itself, which we'll see now and in the next session, it's not too difficult. We will grasp it. Pay attention, think about it, you'll grasp it. But to actually manifest it in life, uh, Swami Vivekananda says it's more a matter of control of the mind and the body to enable it to manifest in life. So that's cautionary for us. There is a stage at which this becomes uh, natural. I, I think it's an important point I'm making, so I'll just dwell on it just a little more before going ahead. See, the one stage is, um, 
where the highest stage where one can say, I am pure consciousness. The world is an appearance. The body is an appearance. The, the troubles of the body are an appearance. I see there's no problem at all. But that's the final accomplished state, the real Jeevan Mukta, who does not actually require any more spiritual practice. Sri so Ramakrishna points it out to his guru, Totapuri. Totapuri would meditate every day. And he was an enlightened person. He would meditate every day. He would sit in samadhi, an actual nirvikalpa samadhi, every day. So Sri Ramakrishna asked him, why do you do that? You are enlightened. And Todapuri said, he had a brass pot. He said, I polish it till, till it shines like gold. If I don't polish it, it's brass, you know. It will uh, have a coat, coating, it will become dull. Similarly, the mind, though you have the realization, you are Brahman. But if you don't do anything more about it, as the mind comes into contact with the world, with the body, with the sufferings in the world, with the trouble of the world, with the delusions thrown at it by the world, it gets uh, roiled up like a, a lake where the mud at the bottom has been stirred up, it gets muddy. It has to be plunged in realization every day, fresh and new. Then Sri Ramakrishna said to him, ah, but if the pot were made of gold, you wouldn't have to polish it so much. You wouldn't have to polish it. Tadapuri agreed. What is that pot made of gold? It's the full, I'm not even talking about Sri Ramakrishna as an avatar. That's beside the point. Just the full, this just keep to Advaita Vedanta. Just the full state of realization, uh, Jivan Mukti, fully enlightened person. That person does not require it. But Dotapuri also had an important point which is relevant to us. If you do feel being that you're getting affected by the world, and most of us till, till the very peak of, of uh, uh, Advaitic realization, we will feel we get, we're getting affected by the world. Then spiritual practice, regular meditation, devotional practices and selfless work based on ethical life are something that we must stick to for a very long time. It helps in manifestation of knowledge. It helps us to overcome suffering. It helps us to get the bliss which was promised. It helps us to be ideal jnana yogis. The uh, jnana yogi, if someone said in Hindi, rota hua jnani kisi ko pasand nahi hai. Uh, a jnani, enlightened one, a person of knowledge, who is weeping, weeping and grumbling and complaining is, is not very, it's not a very attractive picture. I knew this uh, great Advaita teacher, a very senior monk of our order, who was really scholarly, very learned, uh, but he would throw, he would lose his temper at a drop of hat. So somebody said, why do you get so angry? You are the witness consciousness. He said, of course, I'm the witness consciousness. It's the anger is in the mind. I'm the witness of the anger. <laughs> That may be so, but it's not very attractive from the, from the outside. It's better if you did not get angry as, a, as an enlightened person. Okay. Now, uh, back to what our, uh, the central teaching, which will be done in two parts, now and in the next session. First, a little appreciation of the uniqueness of Advaita Vedanta, the uniqueness of the path of knowledge. Spiritual life, which I spoke about in general yesterday, there are many ways, many pathways to spiritual life. The most common one is known across the world in all the theistic religions of the world, in Christianity, Islam, Judaism. In, within Hinduism, there is a wide range of theistic approaches. Shaivism, Vaishnavism, Shaktaism. Basically, the idea of a relationship with the ultimate reality. Call the ultimate reality God or Vishnu or Shiva or Sri Hari, as it is done here, or Allah, ultimate reality, and you set up a relationship. Who are you? You take yourself as you find yourself. This person, this body, this mind, maybe a soul, I don't know. I have a relationship with the ultimate reality. My Lord, I am the devotee. He is the master, I am the servant. Um, or uh, he is the father, or the mother, I am the child. In India, you could have mother also as God. Very very long standing and very, very highly revered tradition of worship of God as mother. But a relationship, mother and child, or it could be friend, like Krishna and Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord is my friend. It could be child, you know, the Lord is my child, like the baby Jesus or the baby Krishna or the baby Rama, and so on. You set up a relationship with it, a relationship of love, of surrender, of service, of adoration, of worship. So that's one approach to spiritual life. 
that is called the bhakti approach love bhakti approach based on a relationship Re look notice it, it depends on faith if you start off by questioning how do i know that this ultimate reality exists i don't believe any of it any of it well the books say so the teachers say so the tradition says so no that leaves me unmoved then this approach won't work for you and this approach has problems in this day and age because um, it's an age of skepticism somebody said no time in history at no time in known history have there been such large numbers of unbelievers or at least agnostics in this world as we have today it's difficult in this age of rationality and all pervasive influence of science um, to have this kind of unquestioning belief and not just unquestioning belief in uh, something or the other in such a big claim that there is a god of the universe who loves you who will take care of you and if you depend on him or her or it it's a big claim as the philosopher hume said extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof and when you come to god let alone extraordinary proof even ordinary proof doesn't seem to be forthcoming it's difficult to believe sometimes even if you believe as you go along in, in in your path over the years there's no guarantee that at times doubt will not come problems of the world will not shake your doubt uh, shake your faith skepticism will not come there's no guarantee it will not come even to saints i remember reading the uh, some of the last writings of mother teresa and she says that uh, i pray and pray towards the end of her life i pray and pray and uh, it's like praying into the darkness there is no response that's not a problem you would ever have in the path of uh, knowledge for example on a path of yoga that's on the path of devotion and that does not mean that she did not have faith it's but it's something occupational hazard on the path of faith you may be assailed by waves of doubt as against this there's a second path in spiritual life the path of experience mystical experience that's what made narendra nath into vivekananda when he goes to sri ramakrishna and asks what did he ask do you believe in god no 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 have you seen god seen experience just as you are seeing me i'm seeing you can you see god can you experience god later on vivekananda would come to this country and say if god exists i should be able to see god if i have an immortal soul i should be able to feel it Look at the language. It's a language. It's an empirical language. It's a language of experience, not the language of faith. So this is yoga. Specifically, I mean Patanjali yoga, but there's a whole range of yoga systems, all of which have something at their core that they are aiming for experience. There's an amount of faith required to start it, but the claim there is not that you have to believe in it till the very end of your days. Not that you have to depend on something else. which will respond god will respond to your faith and prayers no 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 this is a path preeminently a path of experiment practice uh, and uh, uh, experience spiritual experiment spiritual practice and spiritual experience you sit in this way you focus in this way breathe in this way withdraw your mind in this way internalize your thoughts and focus and you will get proof of the claims of religion and this is something that suits the the mood of this age that is the kind of thinking we have in this modern age that's why swami vivekananda i think when he came to new york the first book that he translated commented upon published in the west was raja yoga which is a commentary a very fresh commentary on the patanjali yoga sutras which is experience great but then uh, what's the problem with this path there is a problem with this path the problem is that uh, it can be doubted a, psych uh, a psychiatrist or a neuroscientist today will say i don't doubt that you are you think you are experiencing god you are feeling one with the universe i don't doubt you are feeling that but that's not because you are one with the universe it's because you have a stroke in your brain and some side of your brain there is a blood clot and and that's making you feel there was a trained neuroscientist who actually had such an episode And she was she was strange. She understood what was happening in the brain, and she felt one with everything. If you take drugs, psilocybin, I think it's a new uh, set of experiments going on. At one time, it was LSD. Um, 
you know, uh, Albert, later Ramdas, and, and was that Larry, um, very famous Harvard psychologists, Timothy Leary, the doors of perception. Are. So you can simulate, you can generate such experiences. And they will say that, uh, the uh, critics will say, um, well, that's all right, but doesn't prove anything. You are getting these experiences, doesn't prove anything. Not only that, in spiritual life, it can lead, or lead to a series of experience chasing, experience chasing. I am getting uh, this mystical experience, next I'm looking for that mystical experiences, and my mystical experiences are better than your mystical experience. I am more misty than you, not mystical. <laughs> so it's all very mystifying. And this is not a new problem that, uh, you know, today because we have neuroscience, and psychiatry and all. All throughout history, notice what was the public's reaction to mystics. What was the people, reaction of people in Dakshineshwar to Sri Ramakrishna? Most of them didn't think he was an avatar or an enlightened person. They thought he was just plain crazy, mad. And mystics throughout history, in every religion, those who have extraordinary experiences of the divine, they do have it, but people around are or they tend to be skeptical and they have a right to be skeptical why because those experiences are exclusive if you read the gospel of sri ramakrishna sri ramakrishna is an experience of the divine mother kali and it's a wonderful description but notice one thing it's only sri ramakrishna who's experiencing it now nobody else they feel a presence they feel a radiance an upliftment but they don't see that not even once, and Sri Ramakrishna sees, sees the Divine Mother several times every day. So people can be skeptical about it. As against the path of faith, devotion, as against the path of uh, mystical experience, we are going to talk about a different path. I've taken so much time to distinguish it because I want you to appreciate how unique this path is. What is this path? The path of knowledge, the path of spiritual inquiry. Um, what does this do? It does not say you have to believe. No, 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 you must not believe, you must question. That's what makes it very appealing to people today. You are expected to question. It does not even say mystical experience, it's based on experience. It has the advantage of being based on experience, but not mystical experience, not necessarily. Any experience, just the experience of waking, dreaming and deep sleep, do you wake? Do you dream? Do you fall into deep sleep? Yes, especially in Vedanta classes, deep sleep. <laughs> and that's enough. That kind of experience is enough for you to start and go on with the uh, search in Vedanta. Do you have the experience of subject and object? I am seeing you, you are seeing me. The subject object experience, all experience, it's common. The common structure of all experience, not just human beings, not just Vedantins or human beings or spiritual seekers, all living creatures have a subject object kind of experience. I am the experience and this is the experience and we, I have an experience of it. If you have that and everybody has that, that's enough for Advaita Vedanta. That's enough. You can start Drik Drishya Viveka, the inquiry into the seer and the seer. If you experience waking, dreaming, deep sleep, it's enough. You can now start the highest Advaitic teaching. You can take up the inquiry into the three states of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And Vedanta says, we will, I will guide you to that highest intuitive realization that I am the absolute existence consciousness place. On the basis of common experience, you don't have, you don't give scope to a psychiatrist or to a neurologist or to uh, anybody else to say that you are crazy or no, that person who says crazy has exactly the same experience which you have, which Advaita Vedanta wants. No more is required. That's it. Advaita Vedanta talks about a reality which is here and now and it's you. So notice, in every other path, the, that which we are saying, looking for God or whatever it is, is pushed out there. It's there, not here. Big billboard. God is in heaven, which means not here. It's there. But Advaita Vedanta says what we are looking for is not only there, it's there too, but it's here. Sometimes it's distanced in time. After death, you will see God. Big, ominous billboard. 
After death, you will see God. And below, call 1800. <laughs> now look at the word. What struck me was the tense after. And I have no doubt that after death, you will see God and you are blessed. But Advaita Vedanta says, not after, but here also, now. Not then, now. And whatever it is that your religion is telling you about, it's certainly not you. It's something other than you. Advaita Vedanta says, yes, other than you, but you too. You are the one which is important. We're looking into you here and now. You here and now. Not separated in time, not separated in, in uh, uh, space, not separated by object. You here now. In Sanskrit, desha kala vasu. Not other desha space, not other kala, not other time, not other was to some other object, but you here and now. The problem with that you here and now approach, though it sounds very uh, amazing, uh, you know, convincing, then immediately the demand will be, oh, if it is now, if it is here, and it is I of all things, show me, why isn't that I'm not, I am unable to realize it. If it's not distance, if it's not time, it's not something other, if it's I here now, I should be able to feel that divinity, that reality which you're talking about, and indeed you should, say that by the Vedanta. What is it that is uh, stopping us in, in, Advaitic, uh, in, in Advaita Vedanta? It is ignorance. It's nothing more than ignorance, not knowing. The difference between not knowing, not realizing, not seeing it for what it is, and knowing it, realizing it, seeing it for what it is. So in Advaita Vedanta, the spiritual journey is not a journey in space. It's not a journey in time. It's not a journey from yourself to something else. Rather, it's a journey from ignorance to knowledge. Ignorance to knowledge, agyana to jnana in Sanskrit, avidya to vidya in Sanskrit. And therefore, Advaita Vedanta is a knowledge system. It depends heavily on teaching. One master said, in Advaita, we don't believe in intuition. We believe in tuition. Tuition? Teaching? <laughs> so it's a transfer of knowledge. Of course. It's not just, there's a book, there's a teacher, and now I have got the knowledge, which is great. That's not just enough. That also you must come to see for yourself. That also, that's absolutely important. Anubhava avasana tuan. Shankaracharya says, you must culminate in experience. Not a new experience, already existing. But that we must come to see for ourselves. Now, knowledge, I'm developing, developing this step by step. Knowledge depends on um, inquiry. How do we get any knowledge at all? We can get knowledge by inquiring. You read the texts, you go to the teacher, turn up for the classes, ask questions, think deeply about it, and you get knowledge. I did not know earlier, now I know. And this is no different. Here you come to the class, to the course, and then you uh, read the text, and then we inquire into it, ask questions, and we come to know. At the very least, you might say it's very intellectual. All right, it is intellectual. Let's start there at least. Before we come to enlightenment, the path is through uh, understanding. The path is not, not understanding. The path is not through just believing it. It's as I say, that as you go to maybe um, um, university there and you enroll for a class and the teacher writes some complicated equation on the board and says, do you get it? And you say, I don't, but you are great. I believe you. I'm sure it's right. That won't work, you'll just infuriate the teacher. You must get it. You must try to try to get it. So in Advaita Vedanta, we do that. We teach and we try to understand. And the process we all know, Shravana, Manana, Nijithyasana, which means hearing, reflection, meditation. We have heard this again and again. But it's worth paying attention to because each yoga has its own method. In Karma Yoga, you go around doing things and you dedicate it to God. Try to be selfless while doing things. In Bhakti Yoga, there is prayer and there is singing and there is um, worship. The, in, in Raja Yoga, in meditation, there are postures and there's breathing and there's focus and withdrawing the mind in our uh, focus. So there are the things to be done. What is to be done here? Well, what is to be done here is already what we are doing. This is the beauty of the path of knowledge is we are already practicing it. If you're listening at all, you're already practicing Listening, reflection, meditation. All right. So this inquiry, 
The inquiry in Sanskrit is called vichar. How do we go about it? How do we do this vichara? This is the core practice. So we are collapsing inwards into the core, ethical life, selfless work, devotion, meditation, all those are external. Innermost practice is this inquiry. Inquiry, how do, how do we go about it? We ask the question, who am I or what am I? Why that question? Why not what's a black hole? Well, you're trying to realize who you are. That I am Brahman, this is the, going to be the teaching of Advaita Vedanta. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. I'm of the nature of consciousness and bliss. What would that, what good that would, would that do? Remember the whole purpose. Overcoming suffering and attainment of fulfillment. If I realize my own infinite nature, I realize I am being beyond suffering. And I am ever fulfilled. I do not need anything that finite things that the world throws at me. No. So that realization. What Vedanta promises, there's a very big gap on how uh, I see myself and what Vedanta tells me I am. This gap must be bridged. How is it bridged? Through inquiry. How does the inquiry proceed? Hearing, reflection, meditation. So hearing and reflection now, next class, and then meditation uh, tomorrow. Meditation will require a little bit of comfort. So air conditioning tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So the inquiry, what am I? Even who am I? I'd say what am I is a better question. Because who am I? Especially in this day and age, in this country, who am I is, am I a musician or an artist? Am I a good person or a bad person? Those are good questions to ask, but that's not the question we are asking here. That good person, bad person refers to the uh, personality. Am I a musician or a, an artist that refers to uh, the talents that this personality possesses? We're not interested in any of that. We are interested in something deeper than that, not at the level of uh, body, not at the level of the mind or emotions or memories, deeper than that. What am I? And the way we go about it is in inquiry, we notice ourselves. Our attention is drawn to not mystical experience, not experiencing a light or God or something. No, just yourself. What are you? Point to yourself. Here, here, this is what I am. What is this? I, this is I. What are you? This is me. And what is this? This is I. I am the body and the body is I. And that's where we start. We don't often say this, but we act, believe, behave as if we do. We speak as if we do. We behave as if we, we are the body. And we really believe it somewhere deep inside that I am this body. Now, Vedanta is going to um, show us that I am not or I cannot be the body. Not denying that the body is there. The body is there. It's like driving a car and if you suddenly somebody starts saying, I am the car. No, you are not. How will you show that person that you are not the car? You must show that the car is something distinct and you are something distinct. So that's the first step in Advaitic inquiry. By the way, the word Advaita means non-dual, not two. First step in a non-dual inquiry is, is difference. In the inquiry which wants to establish non-difference is difference. The philosopher Arindam Chakravarti was visiting us yesterday from uh, Hawaii. He said, um, notice the great Shankara, his famous text, Vivek Churaman, which is right there. If you go out there, you see the book, Vivek Churaman, the crest jewel of discrimination, Viveka, or in the word I use, dis discernment. You're trying to establish non-duality, non-difference. And what do, you, what do you name your best book? The book of difference. Mm -hmm. So the first step is difference. We must show difference. Why? It's like showing uh, that uh, you want to show that the waves are not the ultimate reality. It's all one mass of water. You must show at least conceptually the difference between wave and the water constituting the wave. You must show the difference between pottery and the clay underlying all pottery. You must show the difference between uh, gold and the ornaments. You can't literally se separate them. You can't separate the wood from this lecture. You can't. But conceptually, we understand. When I say that the lectern is nothing but wood, wood is the reality out of which this lectern or podium has been made. We at least conceptually understand that. And that conceptual distinction has to be made first. So it is on the way to not to, we must establish the two first separation. Why? Because 
The reality which we are, we have forgotten that and we have caught hold of a tiny part of appearance and say, I am this. Swami Virajanandaji, and he's quoting the, I think, Avaduta Gita probably, or Ashtavakra, when he said that the body along with the entire universe is presented to me in a flash. When you wake up, when you open your eyes, when you pay attention, entire universe body all comes together. Therefore, either I am all of it or none of it. But what do we do? I say, I am this much and not that. So in order to change this position, I am just this body and not that. In order to change this position, the first inquiry has to take place. Notice our attention is drawn to the, to the body. Yes. Could you finish that? The paper, the wrapper, you know, makes a crinkly sound. Changing and unchanging. Notice that this body, the first fact that it's drawn to is our attention is drawn to the fact that the body changes from um, babyhood to childhood to teenage to middle age to old age to death. The Sanskrit term. Um, Sage Yaska, he's actually a lexicographer. He compiled the dictionary, Sanskrit dictionary. He says the body undergoes six four changes. Jayate, Asti, which is conceived, comes into existence in the mother's womb. Jayate, it's born, big change, being born. Then Vardhate, grows from babyhood to childhood to teenage, develops, matures, so much change. Then Viparinamati, transforms, matures, and you reach a plateau, you hit 40. Doctor once told me, and I was not seeing too well, went to the doctor. He said, big problem, Swami. He said, what happened? You've reached 40. You have, you have crossed 40. <laughs> One sure sign of crossing 40 is that you, know, you need glasses. Vipari <laughs> Namati, you mature. You reach a plateau. And then you come down from the plateau on the other side. You plunge over the side of the plateau. Whatever seemed easy and nice uh, earlier, effortless recovery from a uh, cold, um, you go to sleep and you were dead tired and you with fresh and full of energy next day. No, not so fast anymore. <laughs> That's a secret which youngsters don't know. It's going to come to an end. So then it's called apakshiyate, deterioration. Begin, things begin to fall apart. You do it well, lots of yoga, and gluten-free, healthy living, then it, it's, uh, it's manageable. Manageable what? Manageable decline. And if you don't do that, live unwisely, it's a fast decline. Things fall apart pretty fast. So the apakshiyati, and then nashyati, death. The body dies. The six, four changes continuously. And yet I notice I have this feeling intuitively, undoubtedly. Nobody can um, say different. I was that baby. I was that teenager. I was that in the teenage body, in the middle-aged body, in this old person's body. I am the same one. I can't say the body was so different so than somebody else. I was there. Changing and unchanging cannot be the same thing. If I am intuitively, I feel I am the same person or whatever I am, but I'm same. And the body changes so much. Doctors tell me every seven years, every cell in the body has been replaced over the period of seven years. In that case, it's not literally the same thing anymore. It's a continuous stream of matter. That's a body. And Alan Watts put it rather grossly. He said, uh, definition of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a human being, he says, it's a long tube in which matter goes in at, a, at, a, at one end and comes out on the other end. <laughs> and that's a human being. <laughs> Basically, that's a human being. So uh, changing and unchanging cannot be the same thing. Think about it. It's a pretty... It's a simple argument, but quite uh, psychologically quite effective. Stay with it and see that, yes, I literally, body is there. I literally can't exactly be this flesh and bones and blood. And another, uh, uh, another inquiry, these are inquiries, which are another inquiry, the seer and the seen. I am aware of the body. Now, whatever you are aware of, whatever you see must be distinct from the seer. I see this book. This book must be distinct from the eyes. If the book is not distinct from the eyes, the eyes couldn't see them. Notice the only thing that the eyes cannot see are not things far off. 
If there are things far off, you could put a telescope and remove the obstruct obstructions. You can see things far off. I was at the Hayden Planetarium in, in the New York Museum of Natural History. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, is a magnificent vo voice. He was telling us that you could see to the very ends of the known universe. So you can. You have, if you have the Hubble telescope and stuff, you can see to the ends of the universe. No, 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 no. What you cannot see is much closer home. It's here. The eyes cannot see themselves. The eyes can only see things at a distance. Swami, look into the screen just in front of you. You can see your own eyes. Now I can see a picture of my own eyes there. Look at a mirror. You can see the reflection of your own eyes. Take a selfie. You can see a photo of your own eyes. The way the eyes see you directly, they can't see themselves directly. And this is a well-known principle in philosophy. It's called that self-reflexivity is not possible. Knife cannot cut itself. A chair cannot sit on itself. So, eyes cannot see themselves. The seer cannot see itself. Whatever it sees, it must be different from the seer. It must be a separate entity. Not only seer, if you hear and smell or taste or touch, whatever the object of your hearing, smelling, tasting or touching, it must be different from the organs which are hearing, smelling, seeing, tasting, touching. Now look at the body. All of our sense organs operate on the body. I can see my body. I can touch my body. I can taste my body. I can smell my body. You, very soon, hopefully. <laughs> if it gets too hot and sweaty in here, you can smell the body. If you're hungry, very soon you'll hear the rumblings in your tummy. You can hear the body. Every sense organ can objectify the body. The body is an object to all our sense organs. Seer and seeing, they cannot be the same thing. I, the one who objectifies the body, I cannot be the literally be the body. This is in Sanskrit called Drig Drishya. Then another argument, there are, I mean, at least seven or eight such inquiries. I'm just giving you some of my favorite ones. The third one is subtle, but even more powerful. Uh, it is called Chit Jara, sentient, insentient, aware, not aware. You are aware. And anything that you are aware of is not you. So I'm aware of this table and the table is not me. I'm aware of the body. The body is not aware of me. The table is not aware of me. The body is not aware of me. How do I know that? I look at the hand. And when I'm looking at the hand, I get the feeling I am aware of the hand. Is the hand aware of me? Does it say, Swami, we meet again? Hello? No, it is not. There's no such feeling. How do you know? Just attend to your experience. Look at your experience right now. Notice your experience. Clearly, it feels like I am aware of this. And there's no such feeling as this is aware of me. The hand is not aware of me. The hand is not aware of itself. The hand is not aware of anything else. Similarly, this hand too, and the legs, and the tummy, and the chest, and the head, no part of the body or the body as a whole is aware of me. I am aware of the body, if I choose to be. The body is not aware of me. The body is not aware of itself. It doesn't say I am body. It doesn't say that. It's not aware of anything else. I am aware of the body. I am aware of other things through the body and the senses. I am aware, the body is not aware. I am conscious, the body is not conscious. I am sentient, the body is not sentient. A little question might be, but the body feels aware. It's because of your presence. You, the awareness, are present here. That's why the body is lit up by awareness. Um, aware, not aware. In Sanskrit, chit jada. It cannot be the same thing. Such a vast gulf. How can they literally be the same thing? How can I be the body? I'm clearly aware. Body is clearly not aware. How can I be the body? How can I be at the same time both aware and not aware? No, why not? I can be both. One monk said in, uh, in uh, Uttarakhand, he said, ah, Gadabi or Ghodabi, dono ek sa. You're a donkey and a horse at the same time. They are literally different things. It's just the opposite. You can't affirm both together. That's enough to be going on with. Changing and unchanging. Savikara and Nirvikara, not the body. Uh, seer and the seen, Drashta and Drishya, not the body. Um, conscious, not conscious. Chit Jara, not the body. In Sanskrit, it's very succinct. You put it in half a sentence. Savikara Twa, Drishya Twa, Jara Twa, Nahandeha. Because of these reasons, I am not the body. No, these are just not arguments. Look, they are not proofs. 
They're not mathematical proofs. What I just said, these, these inquiries, they're more like lawyers' arguments. The lawyer goes before the judge and the jury and tries to convince the judge and the jury of his or her own case. So these are various a battery of um, arguments to sort of justify, to show to us, I cannot literally be the body. The body is there. Then they respond to this by saying, yeah, yeah, yeah I know, I, I know what you mean. I'm, I never said I am um, flesh and fat and blood and bones and um, you know spit and drool and all of that. No, I said, yeah, there's a body, but I'm an embodied person. I'm a person, a mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions, a personal story, ideas, memories, desires, that bundle inside this body. I feel I'm in, the, in here. That I surely feel. And I feel I'm a person. That's what I am. All right, let's inquire there. Are you a mind? Are you a person? Are you thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas? Apply the same arguments. Changing, unchanging. Does the mind change? Oh, yes. So much. In one day, from morning till right now, how many times? A sleepy cup of coffee. Ah, awake. Uh, bored and curious. Uh, annoyed and then happy, depressed, anxious, and then uh, relaxed. Mind changes so many times. In the course of one day, the course of one minute, try meditating, you'll see how fast the mind changes. Keeps changing. And imagine the mind over your lifetime. Imagine the mind you had as a teenager. You say, oh my God, I don't want to imagine that. I don't want to remember that. <laughs> I was that person, yes. So different, the thoughts that I had at that time, the desires that I had at that time, the plans that I had at that time, the gripes and complaints and um, the um, troubles that I had at that time. So different from what I had. And think about the mind of uh, a baby. It could be an alien's mind. Simply incomprehensible to my mind now. And my mind now would be totally incomprehensible to the baby's mind. And yet I'm saying, I am the same person. Tremendous changes in the mind. You can't even call it the same mind. It's changed so much, much more than the body. Then how can I be changing and unchanging? How can I be the same? And yet I admit, I was that baby. I was the teenager and I'm this person now. So the person has changed tremendously. The mind has changed tremendously. The thoughts, the quality of thoughts, the things that I think of, like, desire, fear, hate, all of those have changed. Hugely. And yet I am the same person. I feel I am the same one. So I can't literally be the person. I can't be the mind. Seer and uh, changing and unchanging. Again, apply seer and seen. Seer and seen are different. Rashta and Rishi are different. Uh, if I look at the mind, am I aware of the mind? Uh, am I, can I, is the mind something that I can see and experience? Not see literally, but introspect. When there is sadness, I know that I'm sad. When I'm delighted, I know I'm delighted. So the contents, mind and object, which are seen by me, I, the seer of the mind, cannot literally be the mind. Then use the third argument, which is conscious, not conscious. And this is quite stunning, actually. This is where we go beyond anything that's being done at present in the philosophy of mind. In neuroscience, consciousness studies, philosophy of mind, mind and consciousness are taken as the same thing. There, there is no distinction. If you ask a consciousness studies expert, what are you studying in consciousness studies? It's in consciousness. But what do you mean by consciousness? Give me examples. Let's say thoughts, feelings, ideas, emotions. No, no, no. Thoughts, feelings, me, uh, ideas, emotions. You are aware of the mind. The mind is not aware of you. What do you mean by that? What a peculiar statement. I'll demonstrate that immediately. So simple. Simplest experiment. Think a thought. Like A, B, C, D. Swami, when I try not to think thoughts and meditate, if mind is full of thoughts, you're telling me to think a thought, no thought comes to mind. <laughs> Even blankness of the mind will do. Uh, thought, A, B, C, D. Think it right now. Now notice, are you aware of A, B, C, D or is A, B, C, D aware of you? Is A, B, C, D telling me, Swami, you have never thought me for a long, you haven't thought about me for a long time. Good, you're thinking about me now. Nothing. A, B, C, D, when I say A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, any kind of thought, even this most sophisticated scientific, philosophical, mathematical thought, it's like mental talk. It's like talking in the mind. Those that A, B, C, D is not aware of me. It's not aware of itself. It's not aware of anything else. I am aware of A, B, C, D. 
I am aware, thoughts are not aware. But they seem very aware, full of uh, awareness. Consciousness and thoughts seem to be the same thing. Yes, because it's most proximate to you, the uh, thoughts. Therefore, this it seems aware. So, conscious, not conscious. Seer and the seen, changing and unchanging. Therefore, I cannot be the mind. Then what am I? The most important, before answering the question, what am I? It's most important to see what I am not. In order to know what I am, first important to see what I am not. That's why this whole process of separating first takes place. Though the ultimate goal is oneness, not separation. That's why Vivekananda said the only true religion is oneness, non-duality. But right now we must step back from this fraction of reality which we have embraced, this body-mind, and see that I cannot be literally the body-mind. Because of three inquiries, changing, unchanging, seer and the seen, aware, not aware. This aware, not aware is a very interesting thing. It shows us, it gives us a clue as to my real nature. Notice one thing that, again, notice our experience. When you're seeing me, you're aware. Are you not? When you are hearing my words, you're aware. You hear somebody else's words, you're still aware. Words have changed. You go out of this hall and see the um, uh, bright sunlight outside, the scene has changed, but still aware. When you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, you're aware. What you see, hear, smell, taste, touch changes enormously, but always one thing is constant, you're aware. Not only that, if you do not see, smell, taste, touch, you're still aware. Try it. Looking at me, you're aware. Close your eyes for a moment. Are you seeing anything? Are you seeing anything? No? Are you aware? No? I see here dead silence. Yes. You're fast losing awareness, Swami. Do something. <laughs> You're aware. Awareness does not go away when the senses shut down. In fact, when the waking world entirely disappears and you fall asleep, there's dreams. In dreams, one thing continues. Awareness continues. You're aware. Without being aware, you can't dream. And in fact, Advaita Vedanta has the most remarkable claim in deep sleep, which seems to be no awareness at all. So you're still aware, but there's nothing to be aware of. So that's the Advaitic answer to the question. What about deep sleep, coma, um, anesthesia? Well, there's nothing to be aware of. That's why it's like light in deep space. You become aware of the presence of light when there's a, there's a surface to reflect light. Then you, it all seems lit up. But if there's no such surface to reflect light, if it's just light streaming through space, then there is no consciousness of light, there's no appreciation of light, it just looks dark, black. Similarly, consciousness, awareness. You become, you feel you are aware only when there is something to be aware of. And you feel you're conscious, it seems you're conscious only when there's something to be conscious of. What are those things? They're called objects. What are objects? Forms to see, sounds to hear, smell, taste, flavors to taste, things to touch. These are objects. There are subtle objects, thoughts, ideas, desires, emotions. They're also objects. But then you feel you're aware. Dreams are dream objects. So objects make us feel that we are aware. If there are no objects, does not mean that we are not aware, just that there is no way of appreciating that awareness. Just like when you are uh, seeing, you know, I'm seeing and my eyes are working. When you're not seeing, close your eye, eyelids, you're not seeing anything, His eyes are still there, they're still working, but there's no, no way of checking. So awareness continues in waking, dreaming, deep sleep. This requires an object to make that awareness manifest, just like it requires objects to physical objects to make light manifest. Again, the philosopher Ingram Chakravarti he gave a cute definition of an object. An object is anything that objects to my consciousness. <laughs> Think of consciousness as this spreading out field of light in deep space. Still seems dark. The moment a comet or a meteor comes, it blazes up with light. Not its own light. The light which is already there coming from the sun in deep space. Similarly, consciousness is there. 
But when an object comes up, a thought, a perception, a memory, or an actual sense thing, you know, like a, something out there, then if you feel not only you see that, but you also become aware of awareness itself, if you are aware. So awareness is constant all throughout. Awareness does not increase or decrease. No, Swami, I was uh, less aware. Then I woke up in the morning, I was more aware after a cup of coffee. Now I'm sorry to say I'm becoming less and less aware now. As it becomes hotter and as your Vedanta goes longer and longer. <laughs> so, no. What's happening is the mind becomes alert and then dull and sleepy and alert again. The mind goes through cycles. We are making a distinction between mind and awareness. What mediates between awareness, consciousness and the world outside is the mind. Mind can go to sleep. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep are not states of consciousness in Advaita Vedanta. They are states of the mind. Mind awakes. The mind falls asleep. The mind dreams. The mind shuts down and goes into deep sleep. Consciousness is constant. Awareness is constant. This awareness is also trouble-free. Notice, all troubles are in the world or in the body, physical level. All troubles ultimately are in the mind. It has to come to the mind for you to be aware of trouble, of suffering. There could be trouble at the bodily level and you, could, you may not have any trouble at all at the mental level. Person who is sick and dying in the ICU, in the hospital there, if that person goes to sleep, at that point, that person has, has no appreciation of the troubles. You wake up, terrible trouble. Go to sleep, no trouble at all. From that person's perspective, not from the body's perspective. So, trouble, physical level, mental level, consciousness itself has no trouble. It reveals trouble. It has no problem at all. Does consciousness age? No. Consciousness was never a baby. It's never, the mind was baby, the baby's mind. That changed. Consciousness was not a baby. Awareness was not a baby. It was not a teenager. It's not a middle-aged person, not an old person. Consciousness, according to Vedanta, Sankhya, all of these philosophies, Buddhism, was never born. It does not age. Consciousness does not become sick. That's what Sri Ramakrishna, you know, when he says, you're in great bliss. Well, the body is not in great bliss. But the mind notices from a consciousness perspective, awareness perspective, no problem at all. Ever fulfilled in great bliss. Consciousness does not become sick. Consciousness does not need anything. Body needs food and drink. Mind needs entertainment, comfort, praise. Consciousness does not need anything. It's ever fulfilled. It's ever fulfilled, ever free of trouble. Dukkha nivritti, ananda prapti. This is the very nature of consciousness. The cancellation, negation of sorrow, transcendence of sorrow, and um, the attainment of fulfillment. This is the very nature of consciousness, of awareness, which you already are, which this analysis reveals me to be. My real nature, what I am, and led to this appreciation, you keep noticing it. And the whole purpose of Vedanta is to point this out and make this evident to us. See, pointing it out is one thing. First of all, we don't even know it. It needs to be pointed out. Then it is pointed out then at one point we say it's not evident to me. It's not real to me. It's theoretical. It's a philosophy. It's intellectual. That's what we... Our first objection is we don't know what, what you're talking about. Second, now when we do know what you're talking about, we say it still feels philosophical. It still feels theoretical, intellectual. By which I mean not real. And Advaita Vedanta says it is as real as say, for example, is there a body sitting on a chair there? I mean, yes. Is that a theory? No, it's a fact of life. And in that body, you feel thoughts, emotions, ideas, memories, desires. Yes. Critical? No, it's a fact of life, Swami. All the time it's there. It's most evident. And Advaita Vedanta says our consciousness nature, that you are the nature of radiance, light, never changing, never rising, never setting, never born, never dying, never getting sick, never getting old. That nature of consciousness, ever fulfilled, is a fact right now. As much a fact as that body sitting there. More of a fact. 
more of a fact than that body sitting there. Why? Why more of a fact? Because the very idea, the very experience of that body sitting there depends on consciousness. Consciousness does not depend on the body. It's more, more solid. Sadhus and Himalayas say, Thasa thas bharpu jyo katyo. It's the, our, the universe is packed solid with consciousness. Sometimes the problem of the way it's taught in Vedanta Buddhism is that it is, you feel it's subtle, subtle, something very vanishingly small, tiny, and they say, Anorani, smaller than the tiniest particle. It's, oh, this is very subtle. No, it's very solid. It's more solid. You should also add it's more solid than the most solid thing. It's denser than a diamond. Every bit here, somebody said, why shouldn't the world be false? Where is the space for a world to exist? What else is here other than consciousness? So you, this awareness, in which that awareness itself is appearing as all of this, we'll come into that in the next uh, session. But I am awareness. This is the meaning. Now when we sing uh, Shankaracharya's famous hymn, Mano but you know, Tidananda Rupa Shivoham. Now you literally know, at, at least at the end of this session, at least understanding. I clearly know what Shankaracharya means. What does he say? Mano Buddhyahankara Chittani Naham. I am not the mind. I am not the intellect. I am not memory. I am not even ego. Mind, memory, intellect, ego. I am not any of them. Why not? You have to tell me. They are changing or unchanging. Changing. Even the ego rises and falls. You go, if you fall asleep, no ego anymore. In deep sleep, is there an ego? I am in deep sleep. No. If you think that, you are, you are not in deep sleep. Ego disappears in deep sleep. And look at the contradiction we, we every day we tell this lie to ourselves. I was sleeping. The ego was not sleep. The ego was gone. Who was the one who experienced deep sleep? And yet I cannot deny that there was deep sleep. Who's deep sleep? My deep sleep. Then who's the real I? It can't, can't be the ego. Ego is a function of the mind. You just see like, all right, do this experiment. I'll show you the difference between, uh, and that's what we tell you beforehand. This is quite amazing. Greg Good, who's a psychologist working in New York, he uses Vedanta, part of his therapy. So he's developed these cute experiments. And that's the American spirit, you know? You take the data and then come up with new ways of looking at it and make it modern, applicable, attractive. Good. Greg Good, good. He says, do this experiment with me right now. You can sit straight a little bit. And the point of this experiment will become very clear. I want you to locate yourself. I here. Am I here in this body? Yes. Where in this body? Look at me. Don't meditate. Uh, where in this body? Uh, draw a line in mentally, horizontal to the ground through your waist, as if there's a line here. Where am I? Try to locate the eye. If I force you to tell, are you below that line or above that line? Are you in the knee? In your big toe? No. That would be very odd. I am above. So whatever I am, I feel I am really more above that line than below. Okay. Draw another line at this level, parallel to the ground. So try to see, just notice. I, if I am forced to locate, is it here or is it above? Above, yes. Most people would say. Very few would say, uh, I am somewhere in the kidney. Uh, I am above. I am above some here. Now draw one more line here. <laughs> Mentally. Am I above this line or below this line? Some might say, I am here. Okay, but most people would say, I am above. And the experiment will work easily with both. Often we've identified the heart. I'm here. Here. Or above. All right, I'm above. Now in the head, somewhere in the head. And it's very natural that we feel here. Why? Any psychologist will tell you it's pretty natural uh, because so much of our sensory systems are located here. Two eyes are here, uh, the ears are here, nose is here, tongue is here, and uh, the face is full of lot of nerve endings which are very sensitive to touch. So it's very natural that we feel presence here much more than anywhere else. 
Not because of the brain though. The brain itself does not have sensory endings. It's just because of so much senses here. Uh, then I'm here, fine. Can you do one more thing? Draw two lines vertically like this. One through this side and one through this side. Are you here, here or here? Think, try to, try to look at, now you can close your eyes, try to look at there, I, 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 I repeat. Is it going here? Is it on the left ear? Or is it, is it somewhere here? It's, most people will say somewhere in between. And most people would say somewhere at the eye level or a little above the eye level, somewhere behind the eyes, maybe, or just around this side, behind the eye. Fine. You will feel like eye is like a presence somewhere inside, behind the eyes, behind the temple, maybe behind the eyes, somewhere like that. Good. Sort of vaguely zero in on the eye, not the EYE, the particular eye. I am there. You feel I am there. Now, quick, what is observing the eye there? I'm aware of the eye there. Who is this who is aware of the eye? Don't answer it. It's a sudden realization what I always identify myself with using the word I, 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 the ego. That's also a thing. Something is observing that also. It's appearing in consciousness. It's a function of Vedanta says, what is the ego? It's nothing. It's a very simple function of the mind. It's called Abhimana Atmika Antakkarna Vritti Ahankara. This is a definition of ego. The appropriating function of the mind is called ego. See, a lot of things are going on in the mind. Perceptions, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, think, and then thinking, remembering, desiring, loving, hating, planning. You need something to coordinate all of that. I think. I hate, I love, I remember, I do not remember, I want, I don't want, that I, 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 that's the coordinating function for everything that's going on. It gives you a sense of identity. That's all. It's a simple function of the mind. It's not you. Ahamkara naham. I am not the mind, not the intellect, not the thoughts, and not even the ego. Nacha shotra jibhe, nacha ghrana netre. I am not the sense organs or the functionings of the sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, touch, taste. Navyoma, Pratejo, Navayu. I am not the five elements. Why am I not the five elements? Why am I not material nature? And they are seen, I am the seer. They are not aware, I am aware. They are ever changing, I am not changing. Same arguments. Therefore, I am consciousness. And he sings, Chidananda Rupa Shivo Ham Shivo. It, consciousness, I am aware of this. Ananda, unlimited nature of consciousness. The consciousness which does not want anything, need anything. Chidananda Rupa. And that infinite awareness is called Shiva. Shivo Ham. Who is Shiva? Good for Shiva. No, you are Shiva. I am Shiva. Shivo Ham Shivo. Literally, you can understand line by line what Shankaracharya is saying here. And all of that, I am. Can we take a few questions? Uh, we should be having a break. We should have a break. All right. And then we will go into. All right. We'll do, we'll do that in the next session. So here we are. We are awareness. I'm feeling very hot, Swami. No, I'm aware of feeling hot. <laughs> awareness is not feeling hot. The awareness felt cool and comfortable. The awareness fe felt the uh, heat and discomfort. I am aware. The awareness is constant everywhere. In birth and death, life and death, in, in for better and worse, awareness is constant. The constant light which reveals all of it. Om Shanti 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 Hari Yom Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Upanamastu